The outlook for the future is apocalyptic. The six years since the Paris Climate Agreement have been the six hottest years on record. Climate dystopia is no longer distant. Our rivers are running dry. Our harvests are failing. Our animals and people are dying. This is the challenge of our collective lifetimes. We know something must change. We're running out of time. Enough of treating nature like a toilet. Fly less, leave the car parked. Future generations will judge us for what we achieve. If we fail, they will not forgive us. We may not be aware of it, but driving or flying produces fewer emissions than our food system. Nature cannot pay that price anymore. The doomsday device is real. Even if we stopped burning coal, natural gas and oil for all other purposes immediately, we'll never be able to meet the Paris goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees, unless we change our eating habits radically. So let this be the moment that we answer history's call. Failure is not an option. Failure is a death sentence. I know how serious climate change is. I know because I study night and day, 24-7. When the movers and shakers in global politics get together to discuss saving the planet, they use her work to back up their claims. I love the sunflowers. The sunflowers are optimistic. Cynthia Rosenzweig is a senior research scientist at NASA. She's a lead author of the food security chapter in the IPCC special report on climate change and land. IPCC stands for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's organized by the United Nations, and periodically, every six or seven years, they gather the researchers of the world who work on climate change, and they produce assessment reports. And those reports are the state of the science about climate change. Few people in the world know more about the relationship between climate change and food than Rosenzweig and her co-authors. We take a food system approach. That means that we are looking at every single part, every activity that it takes to grow food all the way to being on someone's table. So that starts with clearing land for agriculture. It starts with manufacturing fertilizer and equipment. It includes all the on-farm activities, crop production, livestock production, storage, transportation, processing, retail. We take all those different boxes of activities and we study how those emit greenhouse gases, aggregate them, add them all up and are able to say the food system, considered in its entirety, is responsible for one-third of total greenhouse gas emissions. It's an enormous amount. Many of these emissions come from the stomachs of animals like these. Hi, cows. You're gonna be in a movie. It's about what's gonna happen to you. Enteric fermentation is one of two main causes of greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture. The ruminants are a special kind of browsing, grazing large herbivores that grass or plant eaters, and they have evolved to have a special stomach which can ferment the cellulose in plants and uh, create digestible nutrients. Ruminants are little biogas factories. Billions of single-celled organisms live in their stomachs. The cow actually feeds not on grass, but on bacteria and its waste products. Unfortunately for the climate, the product of enteric fermentation in the cow's stomach is belching of methane. Unlike CO2, methane doesn't stay in the atmosphere for centuries, but it has a 28 times greater effect on warming than carbon dioxide. They don't know how dangerous they are. They don't. 
for comparison, we've converted methane emissions into their carbon dioxide equivalents. A cow annually belches into the atmosphere the CO2 equivalent of about 20,000 kilometers of driving. All the world's cattle weigh five times more than all the wild mammals and birds combined. Cattle emit roughly 70% of all of livestock emissions. That's why the beef is the focus of so much attention. But the biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions related to nutrition is caused by clearing forests and draining peat bogs for agriculture. This land development is needed to grow the feed for livestock. But in this way, animals are energy wasters. For example, up to 15 calories of food must be grown and fed to get a single calorie of pork. So we need far more agricultural land than if we humans just ate the grain ourselves. In the IPCC food security chapter, we assessed a range of dietary studies for, for different diets. And when we looked across the whole range, the mitigation potential ranged from 0.7 to 8 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. If people would stop eating meat and only consume fish, researchers calculate we could save around 4 billion tons of CO2 emissions annually. If everyone became vegetarians, it would be six billion tons. And if we were all vegans and swore off eating animal products altogether, it would be eight billion tons. That's more than half of all the greenhouse gases that are emitted from food production. If you reduce the consumption of, in particular, beef, not only do you reduce then the enteric fermentation, then you free up land that's used to grow that feed that can be used to grow human food, but also can be used to have reforestation, afforestation, and carbon sequestration to sequester carbon and reduce the, the driver of climate change as well. If we think about climate-friendly eating, we imagine weekly corner markets offering regional products, Think globally, eat locally. But only about 11% of the greenhouse gas emissions involved with nutrition actually result from packing and transportation. What we eat is far more significant than where it comes from. On average, about 200 grams of CO2 are released to grow a kilogram of potatoes, and even a kilogram of avocados, which are seen as bad for the climate because they have to be transported from South America, still only result in 600 grams of CO2. But a kilogram of pork raised in the village next door produces 4.6 kilograms, or nearly eight times as much. Human beings tend to associate long trips with high emissions of carbon dioxide because we mostly travel these routes by plane. But most food is transported on enormous container ships and its emissions per kilogram are minimal. Only a fraction of the distance food must travel is done by air. Asparagus from Peru, for example, has to be flown to Europe to arrive fresh. Instead of 400 grams of CO2 per kilo from the local market, the flights emit 11.3 kilograms per kilo. And even that is still only half as much as the 21.7 kilograms from a single kilo of regional organic beef from the corner butcher shop. If we want to reduce the impact our nutrition has on the climate, there are two things we can do. Waste less food and consume fewer animal products. We also have to, though, be cognizant that there are many people in the world who probably really don't have those kind of choices in terms of choosing their diet and how their diet could contribute to climate change. But for people who do have choices about what they eat, there is a growing realization that dietary choices can make a difference. From a climate conservation standpoint, the case is clear. In an ideal world, we'd all be plant eaters. But we're hung up on meat. Most of us can't imagine giving it up entirely.
This is the production hall of Rugenwalde Müller in Lower Saxony. It's one of Germany's largest sausage makers. Around 300 tons of pork and poultry are made into sausages here each week. Yet, since 2014, in the facility next door, something previously unthinkable is taking place. Trained butchers are making meat without meat. From this basic mix of rapeseed oil and peas, they're making a vegan version of a sausage Germans call Teerwurst. The texture this time is really nice. It's properly creamy. Good smoky flavors. Mm -hmm. How do you imitate a product familiar to everyone without using the main ingredient? We're using pea protein for the Tayverst. We went for pea protein instead of wheat or soy. That's because it's got to be a spreadable product, meaning the characteristics that make soy so special, the gelling, is something that would have a negative effect on a spreadable product. For other products, on the other hand, I need something that gels. It's got to be sliceable. You've got to choose your raw materials accordingly. These raw materials need to do two things replace the meat protein and provide the right texture when they're eaten. So it doesn't start with taste, per se. It shouldn't distract. Soybeans have a nutty, beany taste, for example. Peas have a certain bitterness to them. And due to the vegetable ingredients, that's naturally there. So in the end, in the application, you can either utilize that, hide it, or make it into something else. The same plants are used in a variety of forms, depending on the desired texture, in flakes, crumbs, or something called texturants. If I want a fibrous structure, I'd likely opt for texturates. They absorb water, soften, and get rehydrated. When I pull them apart, they stretch and give me the right firm texture for my vegan or vegetarian final product. Only after the texture is right are the plant proteins spiced to give them the hearty umami flavors typical of meat. And if we'd like, depending on the product, I can add special flavors that I've cured so that it tastes cooked. But the developers have to consider more than texture and spice. You eat with your eye, too. Just imagine a cutlet that's completely brown. You're not going to really expect much, are you? That's why we've got to select raw products that look like what the consumers perceive as good and tasty. And even though many can clearly tell the difference in taste, business is picking up. The market for vegetarian and vegan substitute products has been growing annually by nearly 30% worldwide. More than half of the population in Germany uses the word flexitarian to describe themselves. After just six years, Rugenwalde Müller is now making more on meat substitutes than real meat. Some analysts expect that by 2040, substitute meat will overtake the real thing in worldwide market share. But making meat substitutes costs energy too. The amount of soy being grown around the world has increased by more than tenfold since 1960. The European Union alone imports more than 30 million tons of soy each year. Creating space to grow it is one of the main reasons for clear-cutting the Brazilian rainforest. So it's anything but climate friendly. But only 2.6% of globally produced soy is made into tofu, and just 2.1% into soy milk. By contrast, 77% goes into animal feed. We actually burn more soy in the form of biodiesel than we eat as tofu. And as much as growing soy contributes to the destruction of the rainforest, four times as much land is cleared for cattle pasture. Climate change is a poor argument against meat substitutes. The real problem 
is that it just doesn't taste the same. Our competition is the animal, so that's always what we're measuring ourselves to. We're really working to take down the cow. In Silicon Valley, California, nearly next door to Google and Facebook, making meat alternatives has grown into a high-tech project. Around $2 billion in investment has gone into the company behind this burger. Our approach at Impossible Foods is to have a very like scientific and technology-driven approach. Um, and we took basically the first five years to very much understand meat at the molecular level. As a flavor scientist, Laura Kleiman is responsible for the development of new products at Impossible Foods. Along with several hundred other scientists, she's working on solving the riddle of our sense of taste. Flavor is actually two things. It's taste and it's smell. Um, taste is just the five basic tastes that you taste on your tongue, but what makes foods actually unique from one another is how they smell. And so that all comes from different aroma molecules um, that uh, when you eat your food, your brain recognizes that pattern uh, as the specific food. The flavor of beef, most people think that might be like one thing. It's just like the, a beef molecule, but it's not. It's actually a combination of, you know, up to hundreds of different molecules that that, that pattern is registered by your brain as beef. So we wanted to really break that down and understand what are all of those different aroma compounds that make beef have that same beefy taste. We use gas chromatography, olfactometry, to break down those really complex mixtures of uh, flavor molecules so we can understand what they each are individually and how they impact the sensory experience of eating meat. The researchers have simulated the process that happens during normal cooking. That allowed them to find out which substances produce typical meat aromas when heated. Once we were able to find out what those uh, precursors were, and they're actually just very simple nutrients like amino acids, sugars, and vitamins. But when we then cooked those mixtures together, we found that it didn't actually taste very similar to meat. It was like savory and kind of close, but it wasn't there. And so the, the key part that was missing was having heme present. It's no coincidence that heme looks like blood. As a component of hemoglobin, it normally transports oxygen through the veins of all humans and animals. What do you think it tastes like? <laughs> As if I had bitten my lip or something. Yeah. yeah. Laura Kleiman says this little hint of blood and the flavors that emerge during heating are the secret of the taste of real meat. So that no animals had to be slaughtered for it, the researchers extracted genes from soy roots, which contain heme in small amounts. They inserted this DNA into yeast. The genetically manipulated yeast is then fermented in a sugar solution in a bioreactor to produce the heme. That was one of the most important discoveries that we made. It's the exact same chemistry that happens when you cook our products as when you cook the animal. The product should be as similar as possible to the original. Every other detail is conscientiously copied as well. This is an example of one of those different pieces of equipment. Some people kind of call it an e-mouse. You can imagine putting like a burger patty or, you know, piece of steak in there. Um, and then the instrument is able to apply a very specific amount of uh, force over time to sort of uh, mimic that chew down and you can do it like multiple times and it measures the the force that it that it takes to do that and you can learn how tender um, is the meat um, uh, how resilient is it does it spring back all this effort has an ambitious aim to change the world because unlike Rugenwalde Müller impossible foods believes that in the future there is no place for traditional meat I think if we really want to reverse the negative impact that animal agriculture has had on climate change, uh, we absolutely have to get rid of all of it. Um, I think that as we start to whittle away at that and consumers understand uh, the benefit of uh, more sustainable choices, it's no longer going to be cost competitive to raise animals for meat. Um, I literally think that like our the next generations will uh, look back and say that's crazy that we ever used animals to get meat. Um, it's just one of the most inefficient technologies that we have. 
Impossible Foods approach isn't the most radical by far. A global race to innovate has long been pitting companies and their powerful investors against each other. Home to some of the competitors, Israel, where they are trying to manufacture real meat. The concept is simple. Meat is no more than animal tissue, which is made up of billions of individual cells. Under the right conditions, in the right nutrient solution, every single cell has the potential to divide and multiply exponentially, even outside of a body. We can take the cells from an animal, make them immortal, essentially allow them to grow forever. And when you're doing that, you can produce, well, everything you want to eat. Jakob Namias is the founder of Future Meat, one of the companies that's closest to achieving this. This is where the real magic happens. Media is being prepared in one tank, and then it feeds these two huge vessels and together they can produce about uh, 500 kilograms of meat a day at peak production efficiency. Um, so this is essentially a cow a day in a room that is more or less the same of people's living room, right? Or, or a large, relatively large kitchen. Um, if you think that a cow needs about 10 months to grow and reach maturity, you can imagine you know, what type of size we replace here. Muscle cells grow in this tank. They give the meat the right texture. Fat cells grow in another tank. They carry the taste. The temperature is kept constant at 37 degrees, which is the temperature of the animal. Essentially, and the cells just, just grow. So you just need to get energy to keep the temperature stable and to continuously and slowly mix the cultures, so the allowing the cells to grow. So we don't need to grow everything as well. There's no need to grow the brain or the skin or the central nervous system or the internal organs. We're just creating the meat. What sounds simple today is a technological breakthrough. Five years ago, the biotechnology professor would have considered equipment like this pure science fiction. I took my sabbatical at MIT, and, and somebody called me. Somebody asked me, what did I think about cultured meat? And I told them that I thought it was the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. They asked me why. I told, I told them that you know, I've been consulting to the pharmaceutical industry for more than a decade. Um, I know what can be done with cells. And cells are producing these massive amount of waste products like ammonia and lactate. If these waste products remain in the media liquid, they will kill the cells, just as the yeast in wine dies when alcohol content becomes too high. That's why Yakov Namias couldn't imagine how the enormous quantities of cells needed for meat could be produced like this. But then I started thinking about it, and the good thing was that I had time. So. I was sitting on the Charles River drinking my coffee and thinking, wait a second, you know, I have friends in Flying Spark that are growing uh, fly lava. They're talking about worms that are roughly this size, half a millimeter, just a few thousand cells each. And they can grow them for a dollar a kilogram. And the reason, the insight was that these worms, even though they are very, very small, had an active liver or a liver-like organ. So Namias developed a patented system that pumps the nutritional liquid out of the bioreactor and through something like a dialysis machine. The membrane filters out the toxins but keeps the molecules that are important for cell growth. It performs the same job as a liver. He says this is the only way to create cells with the right density. Essentially, you can have 100 million cells in a volume as small as this, OK? Almost the natural density of meat. But the key question, does it taste like meat? This is lamb kebab, the very common dish in Israel. It has a 
a significant smell, which is very difficult to get in the plant-based meat. It smells like meat, it feels like meat. You can actually see it, you know, caramelizing right in front of you. This is the Maillard reaction. It's a process that combines the DNA of the cells together with the proteins and the lipids and gives you hundreds of aromatic compounds that are critical for the flavor and the texture of meat. Enough of me talking here. Wanna taste it? At this table, normally it's investors, not film crews taste testing. This here from... Uh, yep. Oh, this from a real thing, yeah. Mm. Yeah. The smell and taste are the same as real meat, because after all, it is real meat. I could get used to this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm grabbing the wine. We say Lechaim. Lechaim? Lechaim. Lechaim. Prost. If it were up to Jakob Nemeus, we'd replace all farms with the quiet humming of tanks. This is a planetary revolution, not a national one, not a cityscape one. We need to produce this everywhere. Dozens of his competitors are working toward the same goal. Startups like Meat Tech 3D, now called Stakeholder, are developing meat presses that are used to mold the cells into the desired shapes. They're convinced that they can make meat that's healthier, more environmentally friendly, and tastier than the original. It sounds too good to be true because it is too good to be true. Joe Fassler is an investigative journalist who writes about the food industry. You can have it all, right? You don't have to kill an animal. You don't have to deal with all these environmental externalities. Um, it's, it's almost like the promise of eating without guilt. Fassler spent months researching cell culture technology. So how do you find out when you're working at this scale if it can kind of, you know, blow up in scale? Is yeah. that through modeling or does it just work at a certain scale if you, so if you just try it? various sizes of the fixed bed. This is not a new technology, believe it or not. These companies will, will kind of suggest this is radical and, and, and fundamentally new. And it is new in one way. It's new that humans have never eaten cultured animal cells before. But we've been culturing animal cells for a long time in vaccine production, in uh, gene therapy, in monoclonal antibody production. The technology exists. And if there was a way to dramatically scale up uh, cell production, you know, companies like Pfizer would have really wanted to figure that out. He says these experiences from years of practical application should make us skeptical. These are very, very expensive processes. And when you're using these processes to make drugs, um, something like, you know, gene therapy, that makes a lot of sense, right? Because it's, it's high expense, but it's also uh, high cost. But for companies that want to use the technology to produce meat, the math doesn't add up. There's a fundamental misalignment because the process is very, very expensive. And what they're trying to create as the end result is what are currently some of the cheapest products in the world. And you can't just, you know, culture animal cells in a brewery or in the back of a restaurant. Um, this is an incredibly um, vulnerable process that needs to happen in an aseptic environment. So in other words, there can't be any bacteria, there can't be any viruses, or else they probably will find their way into the bioreactors and spoil the process. If you are, uh, get even a speck of bacteria through a little, you know, crack in a pipe or something into your reactor, you're just gonna culture bacteria because they multiply so much more quickly than animal cells do. Joe Fassler says if we don't change the rules of biology, the problem will remain unsolvable. One source told me, um, if you really want to make this stuff cheaply and feed the world with it, you have to have vast facilities, right? Just the way that we have vast feedlots and vast slaughterhouses now. Um, but for cell culture, you also have to have 
clean facilities. And the problem is you can't have both. The bigger a facility gets, the harder it is to maintain the, you know, the aseptic uh, conditions that you need to successfully do um, cell culture. But then the smaller it is, the cleanness gets easier, the more expensive it's going to be. So there's a, there's a kind of built-in bottleneck there. He's calculated that a hamburger in a restaurant would end up costing $100, at least. We are certain there's a different way of feeding the planet. Healthy and affordable. We'll see. This facility can produce up to 500 we will see. kilograms. Joe Fassler examined detailed expert reports, analyzed studies, and spoke with many sources. The deeper he got into the numbers, the more unsolved problems he found. It's not like there's just one holy grail problem that needs to be solved. There are multiple breakthroughs that are needed, vast advances that would be worthy of Nobel Prizes, multiple Nobel Prizes, um, if they were actually to be solved. Multiple Nobel Prizes. Joe Fessler's article hit the sector like a bomb. He made a few optimists into skeptics. Others explained in detail why they think all the problems are solvable. But no one knows if the industry's investment bubble could burst any day. Or perhaps in vitro meat could better be compared with solar cells, which are already cheaper today than predicted for 2050 just 10 years ago. At any rate, Joe Fassler is right about one thing. We don't have much time to stop climate change. We are still heading for climate disaster. If we want to change the world, we can't rely on technological progress alone. Either we stop it or it stops us. More investors are interested in growing meat without killing animals. Three months after Fessler's article, Future Meat received a nearly $350 million investment. The biggest contributor? Tyson Foods, the world's second largest producer of meat.